fact that the object represented becomes the property of pure self-consciousness, its elevation to universality in general, is only one aspect of formative education, not its fulfillment. The manner of study in ancient times differed from that of the modern age, in that the former was the proper and complete formation of the natural consciousness. Putting itself to the test at every point of its existence and philosophizing about everything it came across, it made itself into a universality that was active through and through. In modern times, however, the individual finds the abstract form ready-made. The effort to grasp and appropriate it is more the direct driving forth of what is within and the truncated generation of the universal than it is the emergence of the latter from the concrete variety of existence. Hence the task today consists not so much in purging the individual of an immediate sensuous mode of apprehension and making him into a substance that is an object of thought and that thinks, but rather in just the opposite, in freeing determinate thoughts from their fixity so as to give actuality to the universal and to impart to its spiritual life. But it is far harder to bring fixed thoughts into a fluid state than to do so with sensuous existence. The reason for this was given above. Fixed thoughts have the eye, the power of the negative, or pure actuality, for the substance and element of their existence, whereas sensuous determinations have only powerless, abstract immediacy, or being as such. Thoughts become fluid when pure thinking, this inner immediacy, recognizes itself as a moment, or when the pure certainty of self abstracts from itself, not by leaving itself out or setting itself aside, but by giving up the fixity of its self-positing, by giving up not only the fixity of the pure concrete, which the I itself is in contrast with its undifferentiated content, but also the fixity of the differentiated moments which posit in, in the element of pure thinking share the unconditioned nature of the I. Through this movement, the pure thoughts become notions and are only now what they are in truth. Self-movements, circles, spiritual essences, which is what their substance is. So in section 33, we're following up on what happened in section 32. In section 32, we saw that through the power of the understanding, through the power of the negative, human being as consciousness is able to, you might say, tear itself out or extricate itself, to estrange itself from the matrix of what it was engaged in analyzing. And it begins to realize that it is something over and against and thereby mediating with what it is that it understands, what it comes to know. And Hegel says the fact that the object represented becomes a property that is belongs to you know, is, is a possession of pure self-consciousness that makes it into something universal. When I think camera, for example, I have this camera in particular, but I also have a conception of camera, and I understand what a camera does. And I can compare this camera against, you know, the notion or the, the, the universal conception of camera. I have that. That's something that is in relation is in me in relation to that. That's part of that mediation within myself to outward objects and, and also within myself, making sense out of things. So Hegel says, look, you've got this whole process of development that's been taking place in which it gets more and more integrated, more and more complex. That's part of what he calls Bildung, or formative education. Now, if we look at uh, world spirit as developing through history, we have one single process of this, or you can also call it culture, and yet every single generation also has to approach this and appropriate it for itself. That's part of the process of becoming uncultured, of becoming a person within a given time who is not just an abstract, isolated moment, but who is able to benefit from this, this past, to appropriate it to oneself. So the question is, how do we do that in the modern period as opposed to the ancient period?
Here he's going to uh, have another contrast that he's already begun to unpack before. He says, The manner of study in ancient times differed from that of the modern age, in that the former was the proper and complete formation of the natural consciousness. Natural consciousness is, you know, what begins at any given epoch. So, for example, taking... Um, taking an iPad as something that's just part of our landscape is part of the natural consciousness for, you know, anybody who's, say, 21 and, and down at this point. Maybe, you know, we have to adjust that upward. Um, I don't want to get into little quibbles about that. But you see what I'm saying there. Um, for me, a cell phone is something different than it is for my children because I remember a time when phones were, for the most part, rotary and, you know, had, had cords and, plug, you know, they were generally plugged into the wall. And then you had got the touch-tone ones and eventually cordless phones. Uh, you know, what a liberation that was. Those are all parts of the natural consciousness of any given point in time. Another example, you know, a contemporary example would be paying at the pump. You know, that was a weird thing for me for a while, in part because that wasn't part of, that wasn't an aspect of my natural consciousness. Our natural consciousness is our way of being in the world at any given time. So when we're looking at ancient cultures and how they developed culture that was then transmitted, there's a natural consciousness, and what natural consciousness does is... It, um, like he says, puts itself to the test at every point of its existence and philosophizes about everything that it comes across. So it runs into things and it says, what the hell is this? What's that? What's this? Let me taste this. Let me try this. And he's not talking about every single human being at this point. He's talking about the people who are making progress in ancient times, you know. Should I attack that guy? I don't know. I'm kind of scared of dying, but let's see what it's like. That's uh, part of this process that he's talking about. Putting itself into the, the things that it's studying. The, putting itself into its test. It made itself into a universality that was active through and through. So, starting out from what we can call abstract being. Immediacy. Sensuousness. Sensuousness, he doesn't mean something like, you know, erotic or anything like that. What he means is... Being, uh, being a being in the world that we perceive with our senses, that we make sense of, and then stripping ourselves away from a, a complete reliance uh, on that. So Plato, for example, in conceiving of form as being something distinct from matter and saying that there was a world of the forms that was more real, was tearing himself away from purely sensuous existence. But so is anybody who threw themselves into battle and risked. We'll see why when we get to later discussions in the phenomenology. So what is the achievement there? Universality. Making something fixed. Because, you know, this, the immediate, the sensuous, those are like all over the map. It's this, you know, as William James called it, booming, buzzing confusion. And what took place in ancient culture was making things be what they were. That was an achievement in Hegel's view. So, he says, um, it made itself into a universality that was active through and through. In modern times, in our times, the individual finds the abstract form, what it was that was achieved through hard work, through labor, through generations in the past, they find this this abstract form ready-made. The effort to grasp and appropriate it is more the direct driving forth of what is within and the truncated generation of the universal than it is the emergence of the latter from the concrete variety of existence. So we have the products of this process of developing culture and our, our tendency is to take them for granted as being fixed things, to lose sight of what was actually attained, what was achieved in that process, and to treat them as mere things, even to treat them as mere commodities. Um, you know, this is not you know something entirely new to the moderns, 
Lucian, I think I may have mentioned this in another video, has this wonderful satire about the book buyer, the person who stocks their library with all these books, never reads them, and thinks that by having the inert objects there, they somehow possess the knowledge, which is something active, something dynamic, uh, that, that's contained in those books. That's a danger for us. Textbooks are particularly bad for that. I think that a lot of uh, popularizations of things have a tendency to, to do that as well for us. So he says, um, the task nowadays is not so much purging the individual of an immediate sensuous mode of apprehension and making that individual into a substance that's, that's capable of thinking about themselves and that can fix themselves into something, but rather it's just the opposite. We start out with these determinate fixed thoughts and what's really underlying them, we're going to see, is the, the abstract, well, the, the concrete, the purely concrete eye that is, you know, within all of us. Um, so he says, freeing determinate thoughts from their fixity so as to give actuality to the universal and to impart to it spiritual, and I've got this capitalized, life. Why do I have life capitalized? Well, what is life? Life is... A process of ongoing becoming, of appropriating, of integrating, of choosing, of making distinctions. It's active. It's not something passive that takes in these fixed thoughts and then just sort of processes them and, you know, uses some sort of algorithm to make sense of them. No, what we have to recover is this sense of activity and actuality. That's what's, what's at loss. That's what we miss in the modern period. Hegel thinks that we need more of that kind of negativity. So he says, um, fixed thoughts have the eye, the power of the negative or pure actuality for the substance and element of their existence. That's what makes them tougher to unfix. Because that's tougher than abstract being is. Abstract being for Hegel is just, well, you know, it's just, you know, walk around and you encounter things, and there they are, and, you know, you can get to know them a little bit now. This we bring with us everywhere. And in the modern period, we've become aware of ourselves as this pure eye. Through Descartes, through Hobbes, through Kant, through our conceptions of freedom through our very, you know, view that it's important for us to figure out who we are and to determine ourselves. Hegel's getting at that makes it more likely for us to take on these fixed thoughts as fixed things and not bring back to them the fluidity that they really need. And how do we do that? Well, by reflecting upon ourselves. That's what this process of spiritual life is. So he says, um, thoughts become fluid when pure thinking, this inner immediacy, recognizes itself not as the be-all and end-all, but as a moment. Remember how we talked about moments being part of a whole? Recognizes itself as a moment, um, or when the pure certainty of, of the self abstracts from itself, not by leaving itself out, not by setting itself aside, because it's important, it's part of the, the big picture, but by giving up its fixity of its self-positing. So, you know, if we wanted to use Descartes, for example, imagine if Descartes said, um, you know, maybe I am more than just thinking substance. Maybe some weird way my body does matter to me more. Which, by the way, he actually... Read the... The Letters to Princess Elizabeth and the Passions of the Soul, and you'll see the beginnings of that, um, as Merleau-Ponty recognized. Um, so he says, by giving up not only the fixity of the pure concrete, which the I itself is, but also the fixity of the differentiated moments, which posited in the element of pure thinking, share this unconditioned nature of the I. We have to be willing to learn what it means to be an I, to be a subject. 
That means that we have to stop taking so many things for granted. That doesn't mean that we like forget everything or we, we act in some pure vacuum where nobody knows anything. But rather, we have to be willing to allow things to be as active as they are and to see our own role in contributing to what they are. That's difficult. That takes work. So he says, through this, mo through this movement, pure thoughts become notions or concepts, the griffa. Um, that's what the process of the phenomenology is charting out. He says, now they are what they are in truth, self-movements, circles, spiritual essences, which is what their substance is. So when we actually do that, when we carry out this process of formative education and we get away from just relying on determinate fixed thoughts and start moving towards notions, we're going to encounter them and they're going to encounter us and they're going to have a kind of agency because they possess a sort of, like he says, self-movement. That's scary for a lot of people. The good news is, of course, that we're going to see that they're actually reflections of ourselves. But we're not going to see that right away. This movement of pure essences constitutes the nature of scientific method in general. Regarded as the connectedness of their content, it is the necessary expansion of their content into an organic whole. Through this movement, the path by which the notion of knowledge is reached becomes likewise a necessary and complete process of becoming, so that this preparatory path ceases to be a casual philosophizing that fastens onto this or that object, relationship, or thought that happens to pop up in the imperfect consciousness, or tries to base the truth on the pros and cons, the inferences and consequences of rigidly defined thoughts. Instead, this pathway, through the movement of the notion will encompass the entire sphere of secular consciousness in its necessary development. In this section, number 34, and in the very short section, 35, that follows, Hegel's kind of bringing things together now. Uh, there's this constant ebb and flow, you know, introduce new notions or new ways of looking at things, consolidate them together. And so now he's going to return to talking about scientific method, which is how Miller is translating this long German word, Wissenschaftlichkeit. Wissenschaft, you know, we've talked about this plenty. That means science. Um, Lich is like Kite, the state of, the, the condition of. So the condition of, of actually being scientific, of being along the lines of science. What is that? Now, when we, that, the reason I bring that up is I don't want you, when you see method, to immediately think back to chemistry class or biology class or natural science and think, oh, the scientific method as, you know, we were taught back then. Because remember, science is something broader for Hegel because it has to encompass the human. It has to encompass the person who's coming to know, the person who's conceptualizing, and make you know, that part of the process as well. And that's part of the, that's one thing that science, in the, in the sense that we think of it today, doesn't really do adequately and doesn't teach people how to do well enough. So his, his notion of scientific method is going to be a bit different. And he says, this movement of pure essences constitutes the nature of scientific method in general. So what is he talking about there? This is referring back to the previous... Uh, section. The movement of pure essences, or thoughts, that we we're finishing up with at the end, these were fixed and have to be transmuted into notions, into begriffa, into concepts, into some sort of, sort of dynamic thing. And this becomes, instead of just a movement, which is, you know, being carried out upon them, it has to become a self-movement. That's part of what makes them notions. So he says, this movement of, of pure essences constitutes the nature of scientific method in general. There's something about the systematic, 
the integrating function of science that gets us to move away from fixed thoughts that we just take for granted as being familiar and look at them and allow them to come to life as dynamic holes, dynamic concepts, dynamic notions. So he says, if we think about this in terms of the connectedness of their content, the, the fact that um, each one of these things that we're studying is connected with the other things, that there's no, you might say, scientific, hermetically sealed containers with biology over here and physics over here and history over here with nothing to do with each other. If we reject that sort of notion, and we say, actually these things are connected with each other, once we start realizing that connectedness, that moves us towards looking to try to have some sort of organic whole. These are words that, again, to use you know the, the defamiliarization, we really ought to spend a little bit of time defamiliarizing ourselves from organic whole because people often ter talk in terms of holism or things being organic, they just sort of arise. Hegel doesn't actually mean it in that sense. He thinks that this is going to be differentiated, complexly connected together, it's going to be articulate, it's not going to be some vague, uh, you know, loosey-goosey sort of thing. It's going to be very rigorous. So he says, um, through this movement, the path by which the notion of knowledge is reached becomes a necessary and complete process of becoming. So there's two elements there. Necessary... That means that we can actually sort of follow it out and say, this needs to come from here. It's not necessary in the sense of uh, logic, you know, the, the logic that we're used to teaching in the schools of formal logic. Rather, it follows its own developing logic that can only be seen from the vantage point of seeing it once it's developed. That's where the completeness comes in. But notice, notice that he's talking about the notion of knowledge, the begriff, the conception of knowledge. Knowledge itself is not a simple relation of me to the content. I'm actually included within that concept uh, as the knower of that. And that in turn, that what it is that's being known, is going to be incorporated into me. That's what mediation, which he's not actually using the term for here, that's going to uh, come into play in this sort of thing. We should always think mediation when we're reading Hegel. We should always think that there's always connections between things. So he says, um, this preparatory path ceases to be a casual philosophizing that fastens on this or that object. Again, we see this, this emphasis on defamiliarization on uh, not just taking whatever happens to come along, whatever our age happens to tell us everything's all about. If we actually have historical perspective, we realize that's very arbitrary. What we want is to grasp what's really essential to human beings, human development, to the, to the march of spirit. Not just what our age at this point in time in this place with this discourse happens to tell us, and we happen to digest and assimilate and assume and then you know regurgitate back out as good consumers of information, we want to exercise a little bit more responsibility and care. Because that's part of what it means to realize the potentiality of human being. Not just to have knowledge in the sense of having accumulated a lot of things in your head, or even some, you know, vague notion of being able to apply it, but actually being able to conceptualize in a rigorous, systematic way that takes you into account and places you, in human history, what this knowledge business is about. So he says, um, we, we want to get away from just casual philosophizing that fastens on this or that object, relationship, or thought that happens to pop up or tries to base the truth on the pros and cons, the inferences and consequences of rigidly defined thoughts. Instead, 
what we're looking at is the movement of the notion, the movement of the concept. And again, we, you know, we can talk about this in terms of like the march all the way through history up to Hegel's time. Or we can think about it in terms of something that every single generation faces as part of the necessity to, to reappropriate, reassimilate, and thereby learn what it means to be fully human, uh, to, to make themselves part of that movement of the notion. So Hegel sees these two things as intimately connected. The movement of the notion through history, through these, these stages of consciousness, is really about developing knowledge. Now that may strike you as really weird that you wait a second. So wars are somehow about knowledge, so economic processes are about knowledge. So, you know, um, the the interplay between divine law and human law or the family and the state, those are all about knowledge. Those seem like really practical matters having to do with action, with choice, with values, with decision. Hegel would say, well, actually that's all still part of knowledge insofar as it's the human being trying to come to know themselves. And things like the good, the just, the right, are parts of that movement towards knowledge. So he says, this is going to encompass the entire sphere of secular, that is weltliche, consciousness in its necessary development. So everything that's taken place in the world, this is very ambitious, isn't it? <laughs> everything that's taken place, at least the essential things through human history, uh, have to be brought into this as part of the movement of the notion and as part of what goes into knowledge. Now, you know, Hegel uh, in 1807 had a much easier vantage point than perhaps we do. This is one of those points where you might say, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to buy into the whole Hegelian... Um, the whole Hegelian shtick, the whole Hegelian picture of, of, of what's going on, because a lot has happened since Hegel. But the question that you could ask yourself then is, well, is, is Hegel's basic approach able to, to say, okay, new things have, have developed since then, new shapes of consciousness, they've taught us something about, about knowing that goes beyond where I was able to be, could we chart that out and, and reincorporate that? That would be the question that you'd, you'd want to ask. But what he's talking about here is what it means to really be scientific, once again. 